Al Foster's 1985 essay, Subversive Signs, turns on a kind of disavowal, I think utterly indicative of its moment and of October magazine as a whole. It marshals a roster of figures who more or less fall into two large camps. Those whose subversions unfold within the art world and its systems of display, valuation, and circulation. And here he discusses figures like Buren, like Lawler, like McCullum, and another camp, more or less feminist, chiefly represented by the work of Kruger and Holzer. Up front, he constitutes both camps as doing something new. He writes, the most provocative American art of the present is situated at a crossing of institutions of art and political economy, of representations of sexual identity and social life, end quote. While his art world camp leaves me, frankly, a little cold, I've never understood how Buren's work does, in fact, escape the system he claims to critique. Foster, to his credit, recognizes this dilemma, and his analysis of the operations of the feminist camp is strong and convincing. I read it gratefully. But we can glimpse the kind of disavowal I'm pointing to in his description of this mid-80s moment as paradigmatic rather than, as I see it, a kind of retreading, indeed normalization, of an earlier and more radical, um, if only because it was more dangerous, criticality that he doesn't seem to recognize but I get ahead of myself. Writing of Kruger and company, Foster notes, specifically, and I'm quoting him here, specifically the position of the subject must be taken into account. And it is at the point of production of the subject rather than the art object that this work intervenes." End quote. He's right, of course. But it's the strange historical illusions that get me. If we're going to elevate an art that interrogates the subject ahead of the art object, where, I want to ask, is Robert Rauschenberg's 1952 white painting, John Cage's four minutes and 33 seconds of silence, Jasper Johns's famous flag painting, that white work that was right so once orthodox and so threatening together, so much so that Alfred Barr, of course, wanted it for the collection of MoMA and dared not buy it at that moment, hoping someone instead would give it. Surely, empty canvases and silent musical compositions are nothing if not interventions into the subject ahead of the making of an art object. While I could point to the curious constriction of Foster's diagnosis of this mid-80s moment, such that a host of figures that I value People like Robert Maplethorpe or Adrian Piper or David Wanarovich simply never figure. I certainly see why they fall out by the logic of the piece. Their protest was active and direct, not the subversive complicity or ironic coloration, those are Foster's beautiful phrases, that he finds in his artists. But I'm arguing that subversive complicity or ironic coloration this critical attack from within the very structures of power, wherein dissidents can shade with a mere turn of the spectator's head into a form of complicity, comes out of a particular socio-political matrix. One Foster, I'm arguing, has actively repressed. It's a specifically queer mode of survival, born of a pre-Stonewall moment. You can generalize it as camp, or you can dissect it as an act of ironic appropriation. That's why Foster's orphaning of this 80s moment gets me, but not just because it's predicated on the erasure of this queer survival mode that was itself that which motivated the very situated critique this subsequent generation then adopted. And this earlier generation, each of whom swam in the gulf between what they said and what they meant, and I credit here Ross Chambers for that beautiful formulation, um, seduce readerly acts of mediation that make the viewer always an active participant, an empowered decoder 
of the work. But I have a bigger worry than this mere historical amnesia. Again and again, I'm struck by this criticism's close attention to the operations and strategies of meaning making in artists like Kruger, but almost complete disregard for any possible meanings themselves so generated. In emphasizing how the works mean rather than what they mean, Foster and his colleagues at October, and here I'm offering clearly a more inclusive critique, leave a hole at the center of the art they describe. And this space, this emptiness, is dangerous because it can be so easily recolonized by ideology. Indeed, that meaning is empty, is an act of ideology itself. And here's the great irony. That in his careful anatomy of their critical operations, Foster leaves behind the very criticisms these works sought to generate their raison d'être. So what Foster writes of Kruger can also be said, perhaps even more powerfully, of Johns and Rauschenberg, of Warhol or Cage, and I quote him, this finally is the interest of her work, the reflexivity with which it considers the discourse of high art and mass culture, of sexual politics and cultural power. End quote. What I want to know, and I hope we can get around to discussing, is the payoff for this curious historical elision and critical neutralizing. Foster includes in his essay, and beautifully illustrates, but does not parse two works by Kruger. The top one in the article reads, you construct intricate rituals which allow you to touch the skin of other men, end quote. The other Kruger work reads, you destroy what you think is difference. Between these two formulations, I find so much of October's criticism operative. Kruger was able to give voice to what a previous queer generation perforce left unsaid. Her work does articulate and the pathos is that, Foster's, that is, is that in Foster's criticism, so much of that remains unsaid. Thank you. <laughs>